Hello everyone. Welcome to another interesting and informative session of the analyst brought to you by Wajiram and Ravi. In today's session we will discuss five important topics as featured in the Hindu and Indian Express for your larger understanding of the current affairs. The topics are as follows. In the first article we will read about India's electric vehicle policy followed by the state of global climate report 2023. then we will examine the need of self reliance in the defense sector in the fourth article we will cover about the upcoming olympics and finally we will read about the pradhan mantri awas yojana towards the end there will be news snippets specially curated for the upcoming prelims examination so stay tuned As approved on 15th of March 2024 India's new electric vehicle policy has allowed for EV manufacturers like Tesla and Chinese company like BYD to manufacture locally in our country thus India's new electric vehicle policy forms an important component of your GS3 paper under the theme of mobilization of resources So let's first try to understand why electric vehicles has become so important for our country. Well whether it is to achieve the carbon neutrality target by the year of 2070 by reducing the greenhouse gas emission or to further enhance India's energy security in the future the electric vehicles has become the talk of the town. which can also be seen from their increasing manufacturing as well as sales in our country the reason behind this is various kind of benefits which are provided by these electric vehicles such as the environmental benefits a normal internal combustion engine based vehicle emits around 20 to 30% of the particulate matter 2.5 Also such passenger vehicle emits 4.6 metric ton of carbon dioxide a year thus leading to the issues of pollution smog global warming because these greenhouse gases they prevent the ex- outward going extraterrestrial radiation and at the same time they can also severely impact our health by causing respiratory as well as cardiovascular diseases On the other hand these electric vehicles offer zero tailpipe emissions thus significantly reducing the greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide nitrogen oxide volatile organic compounds or particulate matter at the same time they can significantly help us in reducing the oil import dependency of our country As per a recent report India is 80% oil import dependent for our energy needs 50% of this oil need actually arises from the transportation sector However if we switch to electric vehicles then we can curb down such import of oil thus saving us a lot of money and enhancing our balance of payment at the same time it will also prevent us from the fluctuating prices of oil due to geopolitical tension such as the increasing attack in the red sea region or the ongoing russia ukraine war thus it will save us from the issue of imported inflation at the same time we can diverse our energy needs as well as providing the energy security because the energy which is required to charge the electric vehicle it can be sourced from various renewable energy sources such as solar energy hydrogen energy nuclear energy etc thus this shifting towards renewable energy solutions can provide us sustainable solutions for the future at the same time it can lead to technological advancements such as in the manufacturing of electric vehicles production of batteries which are required for evs as well as creation of charging infrastructure and all this will ultimately create skill jobs in labor intensive industries then it can offer us long term energy savings 
as we can see from the infographics these electric vehicles have low maintenance as well as they save on fuel cost also the energy required for this electric vehicle to travel 100 km is only 15.4 kilowatt hour in comparison to 76 kilowatt hour as needed by an internal combustion engine based vehicle also the energy wastage for such electric vehicle is as less as 5% in comparison to 80% wastage which takes place in ICE model. Thus it can enhance our energy savings and also it can lead to the decongestion of cities with the concept of shared mobility. As these electric vehicles have compact designs, if we can create a fleet of electric public transport, it will require lesser space than the current vehicles, ultimately leading to the decongestion of cities and solving the issue of urban traffic. So, if these electric vehicles are so important for our country's economy, let's try to inquire about their current status. Well. Currently, in 2023, India has the world's third largest automobile market in the terms of sale. And this automobile sector significantly contributes to our economic landscape as it is worth more than $100 billion and contributing to 8% of our export and 7% to our country's GDP. Now, as we can see from the headline, the sale of electric vehicles has actually increased and went past 1 million in 2023. However, the sale of this electric vehicle contributes to a meager 7% of the total vehicle sale. At the same time, the government has envisaged to invest $200 billion in this particular sector by the year of 2030. And as per Niti Aayog's EV penetration target by 2030, the government aims to create a fleet of electric vehicles which will share 30% of the private cars, 70% of all commercial vehicles and up to 80% of two to three wheelers. However, if we compare ourselves in global landscape, then the global long term EV share of the new passenger vehicle sale stands up to 70% for China, almost up to 60% for Europe, while for India it is at a meager low. And the reason for such low share of electric vehicles in our total vehicle fleet is because of the several challenges which is faced by the electric vehicle sector. The first and foremost being the poor state of charging infrastructure in our country. As per World Economic Forum, the global average stands at 200 electric vehicles per public station. However, in contrast, in our country, there are only 11,000 to 11,500 stations in total. And as per a report by the Confederation of Indian Industry, there is going to be need of 1.5 million stations by the year of 2030. Thus, as we can see, when it comes to the charging infrastructure related to electric vehicles, we have a long road to travel. Then there is issue associated with the concept of electric vehicle itself. The first being the high upfront cost. The reason for that is because the electric vehicles are more costlier than the conventional internal combustion based engine vehicles which we can see from the infographic for example the nexon ev fearless cost 17.4 lakhs on the other hand the same variant for electric vehicle it cost around 20.1 lakh 
Thus, there is almost the price difference of 2.5 to 3 lakh more for an electric vehicle variant, which makes it non-preferable for the market sensitive segment of our country, which is majorly dominated by the middle class. And the major reason for such high upfront cost of this electric vehicle are the expensive lithium ion batteries. And these lithium ion batteries, remember that India is heavily import reliant when it comes to these batteries, thus overall increasing the cost of the vehicle. And then there is limited model variety of electric vehicles because mostly the passengers in our country, they prefer SUVs for the family purposes. So if there is a limited model variety, it actually act as a deterrent. And at the same time in India, we have this concept of brand loyalty. Thus, most of the electric vehicle sector is actually dominated by the new entrants, which does not found their preference in the larger middle class of our country. Then there is a rising issue of time constraint when it comes to the charging of electric vehicle. So let's imagine that you are on a family trip and suddenly you realize that you are running low on battery and thus you decide to move on to the nearest by charging infrastructure. First and foremost, that charging station is not available nearby. And even if you reach there, to charge an electric vehicle, it requires at least 8 hours, even if we are using a 7 kilowatt charging point. On the other hand, the friend of yours, who was in the other car based upon IC model, he will just fuel up his car in span of minutes and is on the road again. Thus, this time wastage related to charging is a major issue associated with the electric vehicles. Then compounded with the problem of poor charging infrastructure, this time constraint leads to range anxiety among the consumers where they are not sure that even if they purchase electric vehicle, will they be able to cover large distances and have trips with their family. To further compound this issue, there exist policy and regulatory challenges, where there is absence of any stable framework for long-term policies such as tax concessions, subsidies, etc. For example, very recently, the government reduced the electric vehicle subsidy per unit to 15% from the earlier 40% as it was given to electric two-wheelers under the FAME scheme because it was facing the backlash from various corporate sectors. Then all these issues leads to the low EV adoption rate in our country, which is reflected from the table here, where the EV adoption rate as a global average stands at 13% and it further increases to 17% for Asia and 27% for China. In contrast, for our country, it stands at a meager 1%. Thus, to tackle these emerging issues, the government has taken several steps to boost the electric vehicle sector in our country. The first and foremost is the National Electric Mobility Mission Plan, under which the government aims to aspire to 6 to 7 million sales per year of electric vehicle from the year 2020 onwards. However, as we can see, the sales are still low as up to 1 to 2 millions only. Then the government has also joined the EV30 at 30 campaign where the global countries aspire to have 30% of total vehicle sale to come from the EV sector by the year of 2030. In this line, the government has launched FAME2 scheme or Faster Adoption and Manufacturing of Electric Vehicle Scheme 
under the Ministry of Heavy Industries, where the government is aiming to create charging infrastructure as we can see that 241 new charging stations has been sanctioned in various states such as Madhya Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Gujarat etc. Also the government is aiming to electrify the public transport vehicle segment where it is providing the support to e-buses, wheelers etc and 670 new electric buses has been sanctioned in various states. The government also provides subsidy for the manufacturing and the purchase of electric vehicle as we have seen that it is currently providing 15% subsidy up to the cost so that the cost will come down and there will increase the demand for the electric vehicles in our country. The government has also planning or putting impetus upon the manufacturing of the EVs in our country and for that purpose the government has launched production linked incentive scheme not only for automobile and auto components but also for advanced chemistry cell. The government has further reduced the GST which was charged earlier at 12% to current 5% for both electric vehicle as well as charging stations. Then the Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways has reduced the road taxes thus the mobility with electric vehicles has become cheaper. And the government has amended the Model Building Bylaws Code of 2016 to provide for creation of EV charging infrastructure in both commercial as well as private establishments. Finally, the government has launched various public awareness campaign such as Shunya campaign of Niti Ayog, Go Electric campaign as well as e-amrit portal to make the consumers aware about the benefits associated with the electric vehicles. Now let's try to examine the provisions of the new electric vehicle policy in this context. The first and foremost, the government has slashed the custom duty up to 15% for the foreign manufacturers such as Tesla or the BYD Chinese company. But the companies can avail such duty concession only if they make investment of $500 million in the electric vehicle sector in our country, which amounts to Rs. 4,150 crore. Then there is an import cap on how much import of EV units we can have in our country by these companies and that is 8,000 units per year. However, it can increase to 40,000 units if these foreign companies like Tesla are going to invest $800 million in our country. Then the government has further input impetus on domestic manufacturing where the government has set up operational facilities within the three years. So these companies who are seeking such import duty concession or such import cap, they need to establish operational facilities in our country within the next three years and they shall achieve domestic value addition up to 25%. However, the domestic players such as Tata Motors has opposed these proposals because they have apprehensions that it will actually lead to large scale import and it will hamper the domestic industries. Thus, as electric vehicles are really important for our energy efficiency in the future, adequate safeguards shall be provided to the domestic players as well. With these suggestions, we move forward to the next news of the day. As per the State of Global Climate Report released by the World Meteorological Organization of the United Nations, the 2023 was the warmest year in the recorded history of the planet. This issue of climate change forms an important component of your GS3 paper under the theme of Environment Conservation and Climate Change. 
as we have embarked upon the technological advancements and have increased the industry productions with large scale manufacturing it has also come at a dear cost where the exploitation of natural resources excessive use of fossil fuel and release of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide nitrogen oxide etc has led to the grave issue of climate change which is also highlighted by the WMO report according to which the average temperature from the pre-industrial level has actually risen up to 1.45 degrees celsius thus making 2023 the warmest year in the 174 year observational record at the same time this has led to the heat content of the world ocean being recorded as the highest in 2023 and the major reason for this is the increasing greenhouse gas emissions majorly of carbon dioxide methane and the nitrous oxide all this has led to the issue of marine heat waves whose daily coverage has expanded up to 32 percent of the ocean surface from the earlier 24 percent and this marine heat wave is majorly prevalent between 20 degree north to 20 degree south thus significantly impacting our country at the same time all these has accumulated and led to the acceleration of the global retreat of glaciers and the loss of sea ice in antarctic which has changed the climatic patterns which has been prevalent over the centuries such as the contrast in heating and cooling patterns in the north atlantic ocean thus leading to the weakening of amoc or atlantic meridional overturning circulation which basically act as a temperature regulator in the region of Europe and America where it transforms the hot water to the cold polar regions and bring that cold water downwards to the south at the tip of Africa. Now this climate change has not only severely impacted the global climate but also it has huge impact on our country as well because as per the german watch report india is the seventh most climate vulnerable country in the world currently and this climate change is significantly impacting the himalayan ecosystem which stands for the 16 percent of the area of our country where we have witnessed the temperature rise of 0.6 degrees celsius which has led to the glacial lake outburst such as Chamoli disaster which took place in the year of 2021 in the region of Garhwal or the frequent uh, occurring of avalanches and landslides which can significantly impact the life and property in the region. Also as we have seen that there is melting of glaciers the glaciers which holds 68.7 percent of the world's fresh water supply similarly the melting of glacier is also taking place in the himalayan region which can significantly impact india's water security in the future as the rivers which arise from these glacier regions such as ganga yamuna brahmaputra etc they feed and sustain 80 crore of the population then such rise in the temperature and climate change is leading towards extreme weather events such as flash floods droughts etc which is significantly impacting the food security of our country because as the temperature is rising the moisture in the soil declines and thus the crop productivity declines as well
which can be seen from the negative yield in rice, wheat, etc. in the states of Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, majorly the green belt region of our country. And such decline in crop productivity will obviously lead to increase in the prices of the food, which will ultimately cause inflation, which will ultimately impoverish the poor section of our country and thus further increasing the inequality which persists in our country. Then we can see these issues from the case study of 6000 plus crore apple economy of Himachal Pradesh, where last year in 2023, while in the month of February, there was high temperature and at the same time, in month of July, Himachal Pradesh witnessed an unprecedented high amount of rainfall. These extreme weather events not only led to the decline in the supply of apple, but also led to the prevalence of diseases as well as disruption in the supply of roll red networks, thus causing huge losses to the apple farmers as well as traders of the state. As per the Climate Vulnerability Index released by German Watch, there are states which are very high in the radar such as Assam, Mizoram, Jammu and Kashmir, etc. Now, this increasing temperature is also has caused the rise in sea surface temperature leading to thermal expansion where the sea surface temperature has increased by almost 1.2 degrees Celsius and there has been rise in the sea level of almost 0.6 meter, which ultimately is leading to the intensification of cyclones. So if you guys remember in our last lecture, we talked about a cyclone, Freddy which occurred in the South Indian Ocean in 2023 and lasted on the ocean surface for more than 37 days, thus becoming the longest ever recorded cyclone. As well as these cyclones are becoming more and more intense, which is severely impacting our country, which has a coastline of more than 7,500 kilometers. Then, this rise in temperature leads to the issue of ocean acidification, where as the temperature of the water rises, its uptake of carbon dioxide from our atmosphere also increases, thus leading to decline in the pH level or the ocean turning acidific, thus becoming un uninhabitable for marine organisms, phytoplanktons, coral reefs, etc. significantly impacting the marine biodiversity. Also, there is rising cases of El Nino events which is associated with severe drought in our country as it alters the normal seasonal reversal of wind called as monsoon. This rise in sea level has severe issues associated with it, such as uh, disappearance of low-lying islands, submergence of increased flooding and coastal lands, then the erosion of these coasts as well as intrusion of salt water in the subsurface water, which eventually impacts the agricultural productivity as well. Also, there are economic losses which are associated with such climate change. For example, it can lead to the failures of thermal power plants. It can lead to the increasing cases of wildfires as it was witnessed in Europe and America in the last year, as well as it can lead to the loss in gross domestic product or GDP of the country. As it can be seen from the table, where around 1470 billion loss was occurred between 2010 to 2019 due to various extreme weather events caused by climate change. At the same time, all these issues compounds and translates into several social issues such as population displacement. 
which can be seen from the report of the International Organization for Migration, according to which by the year of 2050, there will be around 44 to 216 million climate migrants. And at the same time, this climate change and rising glo uh, global temperature will lead to various cause of natural disasters in the world which will ultimately force the people to migrate to the safer areas. And all these issues will increase in inequality and thus compromise our sustainable development goal target such as SDG 1 to curb poverty or to SDG 2 to eliminate hunger. Thus, to tackle with this issue of climate change, the government of India has taken several steps under the National Action Plan on Climate Change, which is guided by our targets of Panch Amrit, which we adopted in the Conference of Party 26 of UNFCC in Glasgow where we have set ourselves five ambitious targets where we aim to achieve non-fossil energy capacity of 500 gigawatt by the year of 2030, to further fulfill 50% of our all energy requirements by renewable energy, then to reduce carbon emission by 1 billion ton by 2030, and further to reduce the carbon intensity below 45% by 2030. And finally to become a carbon neutral country by the year of 2070. Thus to achieve these targets our country has put impetus on renewable energy. Such as under Pradhan Mantri Kusum Yojana we are targeting for solarization of agriculture pumps. Then we have joined the International Solar Alliance. Then under the Suregar Yojana, we are putting impetus on rooftop solar. And under National Hydrogen Mission, the government is aiming to create 30 million metric tons of green hydrogen by the year of 2030, which act as a renewable source of energy. To achieve all this, the government has also joined the Fuel for Future initiative. At the same time, while we are putting the impetus on renewable energy, we are also trying to curb our carbon emissions by adopting to BS6 fuel. Then under Ujwala Yojana, we are trying to provide LPG connection to 190 million families between 2014 to 2022. The government has also launched Gobardhan scheme where we aim to create waste to energy plants where we will convert cattle dungs, organic crop residues into the form of bioenergy. For this purpose, the government is also launched ethanol blending program where we are aiming to achieve or blend 20% of ethanol into petrol by the year of 2025. Further, putting the impetus on green growth, the government has taken several steps such as its impetus on natural farming under Paramparagat Krishi Vikas Yojana. Then under Pranam, we are trying to regulate the use of chemical fertilizers such as urea which are responsible for the greenhouse gas emissions such as nitrogen oxides. Also, the government has launched an ambitious plan to scrap old vehicles and as we have seen, we are promoting the electric vehicles under the FAME scheme. Further, the government has launched Misti Yojana for replantation and habilitation of mangroves across the coastline. Also, the government has launched Amrit Dharohar scheme for the restoration of wetlands. Then, the government is providing green credit under the Environment Protection Act of 1986. The government is creating a lot of solar power plants such as Modhera, Sun Village. Also, the government has launched Ujala scheme under which we installed LED lights and we saved 4 
फोर्टी सेवन बिलियन किलो वॉट पर आवर ऑफ एनर्जी एज वेल एज वी रिड्यूस्ड कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड एमिशन बाय थ्री पॉइंट एट टन करोड़ ऑल्सो द गवर्नमेंट हैज लॉन्च अमृत स्कीम वेयर वी आर ट्राइंग टू क्रिएट सिटीज ऑन द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ थ्री आर दैट इज रीयूज रिसाइकिल एंड रीपर्पज and finally the government is creating public awareness under the mission life where we are trying to create behavioral changes among the public to save electricity to save water to generate less solid waste etc thus with these initiatives the government has reached several achievements such as india is now holding the fourth position in the overall renewable energy capacity where we have 42% of the cumulative installed capacity from non fossil sources also we have the third highest renewable energy capacity addition in the last 5 years and these initiatives are going to help us to reach the net zero emission by the year of 2070 for which our honorable prime minister has said that in the last 9 years our renewable energy capacity has actually increased from 70 gigawatts to 170 gigawatts but still there are several challenges which persist such as a global framework on climate financing at the same time to create modern technological solutions such as carbon capturing etc which is mired by our low investment in research and development thus to tackle the issue of climate change there are still several innovative steps which are imperative with this suggestion we move forward to the next news of the day the indian express report highlights the need of self reliance in the defense sector for india in the upcoming years as the world is mired currently by several geopolitical tension thus being atmanirbhar or self reliant in defense sector forms an important component of your gs3 paper under the larger theme of internal security So let's first try to understand what is the requirement of indigenization in the defense sector. The first and foremost is that as per the CIPRI report of 2024, India is currently the largest arm importer in the world. As we can see from the map, India has remained the largest importer during the 2018 to 22 period with 11% global share of imports followed closely by Saudi Arabia as second. At the same time, India's arm import majorly comes 45% from Russia and recently France has increased its status as the second largest importer. Now, with being the largest arm importer in the world, we are currently dependent on sixty percent on import for our defense needs, which ultimately leads to the huge import bill, increasing our defense budget, which is currently at six point two one lakh crore. and out of that a staggering 1.7 lakh crore or 27% of our defense budget actually goes into the capital acquisition or import of defense products from other countries thus increasing our trade deficit as well as imbalancing our balance of payments at the same time this translates into huge fiscal deficit for our country which is currently at 5.1% as per the interim budget of 2024 so it also compromises our security imperative because we need to be self reliant especially in the case of turbulent neighborhood where we have got such a good dear neighbor such as china and pakistan and thus we need to be at our toes and at the same time there is rising geopolitical tension such as russia ukraine war which has actually compromised the global supply chain thus we can not rely completely on the import especially for the security of our nation at the same time it is also closely related to our economic security 
Because if we will indigenize our defense sector, it will reduce our import bills as well as it will lead to employment generation. Because as per a parliamentary standing committee report on the defense, if we are going to reduce our import by 20%, it can lead to the generation of 1 lakh highly skilled jobs. Thus, the government of India has taken several steps in this regard following by the Defense Acquisition Procedure 2020, which mandates 50% indigenous content in the procurement contracts. At the same time, if we, there is a company and we are buying from that company, then there will be a technology share which has increased to minimum 50%. And even the buy and make India component has been increased where at least 50% of the total component shall be made in our country. Then the government has released a positive indigenization list under which there are certain items which shall be procured only from the domestic sources. And on Shrizan portal, the government has listed 34,000 such items. At the same time, the government is creating defense industrial corridors in two states currently in Tamil Nadu and Uttar Pradesh. The government has also allowed for 100% FDI in the sector. However, there is a catch. Only 74% FDI is allowed through automatic route and for further 100% FDI, you need the approval of Cabinet Committee on Security, which is chaired by our Prime Minister. Then the government has further put impetus on the Navy do uh, domestic building capacity where, for example, we have created the first domestically manufactured warship carrier INS Vikrant as well as the government has launched project 17A frigates where we are creating multi-role naval warship that serves as a fleet protector and we have created under this INS Nilgiri, INS Vindyagiri very recently etc. Also the, the government's defense production value actually cross the amount of 1 lakh crore in the year of 2023. Further, the government has launched the Innovation for Defense Excellence Initiative as well as Dare to Dream Innovation Contest by the DRDO to put indigenization as well as innovation from the startup sector. Under this Innovation for Defense Excellence initiative, the government provides subsidies to startups for futuristic solutions and products. Then, as per SIPRI, the domestic manufacturing capacity has boosted up because of these steps which has been taken by the government, resulting in India for the first time featuring in the top 25 defense exporters as we have become the 23rd largest defense exporter in the world. Thus, as per the report, if India aims to become a developed nation by the year of 2047, self-reliance in defense sector is imperative. Thus, we shall focus on domestic technological innovations as well as creating strategic partnerships around the world. On the line of this suggestion, we move forward to the next news of the day. We are going to cover a case study on Olympics as the Summer Olympics is going to be held in Paris, France this year which will commence from 26th of July. This coverage on Olympics forms an important component of your prelims paper under the larger theme of sports. So let's first try to understand about the historical backdrop related to Olympics, where it is said to be originated in the 8th century BC and the first ever record, written record comes from the 776 BC from the city of Olympia in Greece where sports such as wrestling, racing, etc. took place. If you guys have seen the movies such as Gladiator, they are based on this very same backdrop. 
Then ultimately, in the year of 394 CE, the Roman Emperor Theodosius actually banned such Olympic Games from taking place. Thus, the idea of revival was proposed by a French educationist named Pierre de Coubertin, which wanted such Olympic Games to take place again to increase international harmony and to bring various nations on the same platform. For this purpose, the International Olympic Committee was established in the year of 1894 and the first modern Olympic game took place in the city of Athens in the year of 1896 as you guys can see from the picture. Remember that the women were actually not allowed to participate in the first modern day Olympic Games. They eventually got the permission for participation from the year of 1900 CE onwards. Then, the Winter Olympics were introduced in the year of 1924. And from 1924 to 1992, both Winter as well as Summer Olympics used to take place in the very same year. But from the 1992, now they take place in this way that the Summer Olympic take place in the first year of the Olympiad as it will be held in this year in Paris, France and then the Winter Olympic take place in the third year of Olympiad and it was going to held in 2026 in Milan, Italy. Now, as you guys can see on the map, the ancient city of Olympia from where these games actually originated and the other upcoming Olympics are the Summer Olympics of 2028, which will take place in Los Angeles, USA. Keep this in mind that five new games are going to be introduced from this USA Olympics in 2028, including our favorite cricket, hand football, squash, baseball, etc. And finally, the Winter Olympics of 2032 will take place in Brisbane, Australia. Now, very recently, our Honorable Prime Minister has claimed to make an ambitious target that India is going to host the Olympics of 2036. Till now, only three Asian countries have hosted the Olympics so far, being China, Japan and South Korea. Now, to host the 2036 Olympics, India need to file its submission to International Olympic Committee, which eventually decides the city which is going to host the Olympic seven years prior. Now, we will try to understand some facts related to prelims, such as the motto of Olympic, which is faster, higher and stronger and the five rings in the Olympics flag, they actually symbolizes the five continents which are linked together from the rings of friendship. In 24 Ol Olympics, which has taken place since 1896, India has got 35 medals so far. Keep this in mind that in our golden period, our hockey team won five consecutive gold medals from the year of 1928 to the year of 1948. Also, the achievements of Indians in the recently held Tokyo Olympics can be seen from the table where the Mirabai Chanu won us a silver and the Neera Chopra who won us a gold medal in the javelin throw. Thus, hosting the Olympic events in the year of 2036 can actually increase the global stature of our country and it also showcases the increasing reputation of our country. Thus, all steps shall be taken in this direction to make sure that this distant dream becomes a reality. With this noble thought in our head, we move forward to the next news of the day. In this particular segment, we are going to cover the important provisions of Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, which is often seen in the news, and the targets achieved by this scheme so far. And this coverage is going to form an important component of your GS2 paper under the theme of Government Policies and Interventions. Well, Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana has two components, one being the rural and the other being the urban. 
द रूरल स्कीम इज अप्लाइड बाई द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ रूरल डेवलपमेंट एंड कीप दिस इन माइंड दैट इट इज अ सेंट्रली स्पॉन्सर्ड स्कीम which means that the center provides for 60% of the funds while states are responsible for their 40% of the share however for the hilly states this provision stands for 90% by the center and 10% by the hilly states the scheme aims to achieve the housing for all by the 2022 Similarly the urban scheme is deployed by Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs again being a centrally sponsored scheme with the larger objective to achieve housing for all by the year of 2022 Finally the scheme aims to provide for pakka houses with basic amenities to the beneficiaries The beneficiaries for the rural segment stands as the people who are below poverty line or come from SC and ST or were serving as a bonded laborers or the widows or next of the kin of any defense personnel who has died in the action or any retired member of paramilitary forces as well as a special preference is given to disabled people as well as minority there stands three step verification done accordingly by so, so socio economic caste census of 2011 gram sabha as well as geo tagging by the local authorities finally the unit assistance stands 1.2 lakh for the houses in the plain areas and 1.3 lakh for the houses in the hilly areas then the scheme aims to converge and provide several amenities such as pipe drinking water under jal jeevan mission electricity connection as well as lpg gas connections etc under the ujwala scheme then for the urban scheme the beneficiaries are recognized as per the urban poors and slum dwellers and the preference is given to senior citizens st obc etc and to the minority women and transgender and the scheme aims to empower the women as the registration of ownership is done in the name of female members as per the recent data available on the website of the ministry there has been 118 lakh houses which has been sanctioned and 30 around 82 lakh houses has been completed which also showcases an abysmal rate of completion as around more than 30 lakh houses are yet to be complete then even though the central assistance which has been committed is at 2 lakh crore the total assistance release is only 1 lakh 63000 crore thus there are several issues which are associated with the scheme which shall be taken care of for the better implementation of the scheme with these suggestions we move forward to the next section of our news in this particular segment in prelims snippet we are going to cover some important news which are especially curated for your upcoming prelims examination which we have picked from several articles which featured in the today's news the first and foremost being about the rakesh sharma this also falls under the theme of the achievements of indians in the field of science and technology well the name of the astronaut wing commander rakesh sharma has been etched into the history as on this very date on 3rd of april years back in 1984 he became the first indian to travel to the space he was accompanied by two cosmonauts from the soviet union and they flew on board in soyuz t11 to the space station of ussr at that time salyut 7 there he spent 7 days 21 hours and 40 minutes in the space on board to the salute 7 space station this achievement came as a joint mission of isro as well as the soviet intercosmos space program 
The highlight of the event was when in a joint TV news conference, the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi asked Rakesh Sharma that how the India looked from the space and he proudly replied, Sare jahan se achha. Then we are going to read about the Purchasing Managers Index. The Purchasing Managers Index is released by S&P Global India Manufacturing which is basically a survey based measure that asks the respondents about the changes in their perception about the key business variables. The purpose of this PMI index is to provide the information about the current as well as future businesses conditions to the company decision makers, the analyst as well as the investors. It is calculated separately for the manufacturing and the service sector. And then finally, a composite index is constructed. Now here comes an important statement for, for your prelims, which is that the PMI is basically a number from 0 to 100. If the number is above 50, it basically means expansion. And if it is below 50, it basically denotes a contraction. A reading at 50 indicates that there is no change among the respondents about how the economy is going forward or behaving currently. Thus, if the PMI of the previous month is actually higher than the PVI, PMI of the current month, it represents that economy is basically contracting. Keep this information dear to you for the prelims and we move forward to the next snippet which is about the Drugs and Magic Remedies Act of 1954. Why it is in the news? Because the Supreme Court recently came down heavily on Baba Ramdev's Patanjali Ayurved for publishing some misleading advertisements which are regulated under this Drugs and Magic Remedies Act or DOMA. Now, under the Section 4 of DOMA, there is a prohibition against publishing such misleading advertisement related to drug. For example, to sell my drug, I tell you that just take this and this is completely going to cure your disease. But if this claim is based upon no such research being done, then basically I am misleading you for my own profitable measures. Thus, the government has establish this act which describe as an advertisement which directly or indirectly gives a false impression regarding the true character of the drug or make a false claim of the drug as I did with you. Then this such publishing a misleading advertisement under this particular act is actually punishable with up to six month imprisonment if it is the case of the first offense. But if I am going to make another such false claim, then the period of imprisonment can actually extend up to one year. With this, we move forward to the last news of the day, which is associated with a geophysical phenomena called as Kalakadal. Right? What is Kalakadal and why it is in the news? Well, recently, hundreds of houses have been flooded in the several coastal areas of Kerala, such as Kollam and Tiruvananthapuram, due to high sea waves, which are also known as swell waves. Such flooding has been called due to a swell surge in Kalakadal, which is called Kalakadal in Malayalam. And this term was also recognized and approved by the UNESCO in the year of 2012. What does Kalakadal stands for? It stands for the essential coastal flooding which take place during the pre-monsoon season between the month of April and May where such swell waves on the southwestern coast of our country. Now remember a very important fact that these ocean swells occur not due to any local wind but rather due to the distant storms like hurricanes or even long period of fierce gale winds. Thus often people actually 
मिस इंटरप्रेट सच कलकदल और स्टॉम स्वेल इवेंट टू एन अपकमिंग सुनामी दस दिस ड्यूरिंग सच स्टॉम देयर टेक्स प्लेस अूज एनर्जी ट्रांसफर फ्रॉम एयर इन टू द वॉटर and this latest instant took place after there was a low atmospheric pressure system which was formed and it moved over the region from the south atlantic ocean which is 10000 kilometers of the indian coast thus the kalakadal does not take place because of the local wind system rather because of the distant low pressure system which was formed as far as 10000 kilometers from the indian coast however there has been a strong warning system which has been created such as swell surge forecast system which was launched by the indian national center for ocean information services or incois in 2020 which can predict such storm surge in 7 days in advance and provide forecasting remember such important facts for the prelims examination and with this we have reached to the end of the discussion today do not forget to attempt the questions at the end of the video to test your knowledge we will meet in a very interesting session very soon till then all the very best for your preparation and thank you